Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the Comox Valley Regional District regular board meeting of Tuesday, September 21st to order. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. And today we're gonna to read Article 40 from the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Indigenous peoples have the right to access to and prompt decision through just and fair procedures for the resolution of conflicts and disputes with states or other parties as well as to effect remedies for all infringements of their individual and collective rights. Such a decision shall give due consideration to the customs, traditions, rules, and legal systems of Indigenous peoples concerned in international human rights. With that, we move to our in-camera motion, and we will go in camera um, pursuant to section 91A, C, and E of the Community Charter. Mayor and McCullen, thank you. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And that brings us to C, adoption of minutes from October 24th. Cole Hamilton and Harbor, thank you. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. And that brings us to delegations. Today we have the Comox Valley Arts Council joining us, Evangeliker and Dallas Stevenson. McCollum and Arbor, thank you. And anyone opposed? Oh, sorry, we'll, we'll finish that after. <laughs> so we'll welcome uh, Evan and Dallas. Are you on the line? Yes, hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So you thank have, you. Uh, welcome, you have 10 minutes to present and staff have the PowerPoint ready to key up when you are ready. Great, yeah, so before we get started with the PowerPoint, um, thank you, uh, Chair Kettler and um, directors for receiving us. Uh, my name is Evan Jindikar. I'm the Vice President of the Comox Valley Arts Council, and we have our Executive Director here with us today, Dallas Stevenson. Um, and in true artistic fashion, we have a very engaging uh, audio-visual presentation, um, perhaps different than what you might have seen before, but we attempt at all levels to support artists in our community as much as possible. So as you take in the presentation, please enjoy the music by one of our local artists, Blaine Dunaway. And then after the presentation, we'll uh, go over a few things that we wanted to chat with you um, as well. So we can cue that up now. Okay, that sounds lovely. Sorry, we're just having some audio issues. Yeah. We're just gonna restart it. Thank you. 
Okay, I think it's done. We actually didn't have the presentation up on our screen. And I wanna acknowledge that Director Grieve also wasn't able to hear or see the presentation. Uh, so we can just make sure that that gets sent to him. That would be great. Um, can everyone still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And we apologize for the technical problems there. That, that's okay. Um, yeah, so as you can see, you know, we've been hard at work over the pandemic to try to reach our community members to support our artists and we still manage to do a lot of programming and we have a few ideas around how we want to move forward in, in this community and I did want to start by just acknowledging and sharing our deep appreciation for the ongoing relationship between staff. Uh, Dallas is leading that work with staff at the regional dis district. Um, and the support through the arts and culture grant that we receive each year from the uh, regional district. And, you know, that helps us with facilities. It helps our, our partners and the cultural stakeholders groups. Uh, but what it doesn't include is any support towards a regional policy on arts, culture, and heritage, uh, or support to, directly for programming. So um, that presentation was kind of an overall uh, of where we've been over the last little bit how we do our funding. And we talked a little bit about stuff that uh, you are probably very well aware of. We did send along in the spring to Chair Kettler and Vice Chair Hamir uh, a report on uh, tourism in our communities and um, uh, the marketing um, related to tourism. And so today we kind of really wanted to talk about two things. Mostly uh, we want to propose to uh, the regional district uh, that we move forward in a deeper, more formal relationship with the Comox Valley Arts Council. And so this would look like initiating and supporting uh, and funding a, a formal working group uh, with the aim of adv advising on issues and supports for the arts and culture and heritage sectors. Um, you know, we recognize that we have a very large community uh, in uh, the Comox Valley Regional District uh, that needs support, especially uh, as we come out of the, the, the pandemic together. And one of the first major tasks for this group would to really level up our region. Um, you know, we, we compared in our um, cultural stakeholders uh, assessment that 
communities like Camel River and Seychelles and Nelson, similar size to, to Comox Valley, have a regional plan when it comes to art and culture. Uh, they have policies as it relates to arts, culture, and heritage. And so part of that would be an immediate um, task for that working group would be to develop that plan for the community and the policies related to that plan. And so um, that would also formalize the contribution of arts and culture to our community and provide a much needed foundation to grow and connect from. Um, you know, the, the last piece before we get into to questions, I guess, on the presentation is uh, related to the, our Converge Cultural Tourism and Marketing in the Comox Valley, that report that was sent um, earlier this year. And so really we're wanting to highlight that again today because we recognize that tourism is going to be a vital part of our recovery in this community. Uh, and for it to be generative, we need to attract people to our community and that requires financial investment. This obviously looks like traditional marketing activities, uh, but at the moment we lack a collective brand for our uh, creative community, uh, which can really be leveraged to establish both a visual brand, but also uh, for the actual creative community to come together uh, with a collective vision. And you know, part of this is a specific request that we have for art specific tourism marketing. And we recognize that the regional district has moved away from SVEDS over to Tourism Vancouver Island, which has taken over the contract. And we do have a positive working relationship with them, but we recognize uh, that the, um, the Arts Council has a unique expertise on the who, the what, the where of the arts and culture, and the importance of highlighting these communities as a hub for tourism on Vancouver Island, for a place to come experience art, to enjoy art uh, and culture and heritage. And so um, as we wait on Tourism by Vancouver Island to decide on their plan, recognizing the circumstances, uh, we wanted to just highlight that there's an opportunity here for us to support marketing strategies that uh, support our artists and our cultural sector in their communities. Um, you know, and this also looks like supports for our sp art space community development. Uh, you know, we had Elevate Throw, the wonderful festival this weekend in Cumberland. And so this would look like supports for events and festivals, creative placemaking and, and regional arts projects, which uh, we don't have a collective coordination around. Um, and just lastly, part of that too, we recognize that you, uh, the regional district's going through strategic planning right now. And so uh, part of what uh, SVEDS has done through their economic recovery task force was actually allow for the CBA to do a real analysis of what we need to get through this recovery when it comes to our artistic and cultural creative communities. And so a lot of what we're asking for today is really just aligning with that uh, report that came out um, with SVEDS on our economic recovery uh, plan for the Valley. Great, thanks so much. We do have um, some questions for you. We'll start with Director Arbor. Thank you, that was a really good presentation. I really liked the, the style of it and the slides and, and the music as well and the information. As, and some of it went by a little quickly and I was really interested in some of the economic stats. Yeah, and coincidentally, an hour ago, I was interviewed by the Times Colonists on the new Ornby Art Center, one of your members and its contribution to the vitality of the community. and. Uh, fully recognize, I think this board has really recognized the value to the arts, but I think you're probably right in your assessment that it's been caught up a little bit into our, uh, our journey with CVETs the last couple of years. And, uh, and I think some, personally, I believe your requests are quite reasonable in terms of how they might fit with, um, you know, we have a new economic development officer that's actually carrying on with the work uh, and, uh, no, okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I missed that. So, anyways, we have we have some capacity, uh, definitely, in, in in the next year as as we um, we move into the past post events world, and um, in the question of the arts, I think you had done a good job. I, I remember what, seeing the submission from uh, from the arts on, as part of the task force. In in terms of the regional plan, again, uh, fully in support of of. Uh, regional district supporting that in the sense that that's a role that this board is serving on the housing front in regards to the homelessness, like pr providing some resources and, and a place where all stakeholders can collaborate, create a collective plan and, and strategies. So 
Um, yeah, thank you for coming to present. And I'm, I, I saw a little nod from the CAO, but I'm, I'm hoping we're able to find the space to support your request. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Hamir. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to Evan and, and to um, uh, Dallas for, for the presentation. I, I, I concur, it was really well done. And um, the report as well, the Converge report, um, really chock full of a lot of um, good information. Um, and so my question is, you know, kind of, you've answered a bit of it uh, because the report really was focused on sort of the difficult relationship that, that the arts community had with, with seabeds. And you've mentioned that the uh, relationship's a bit better with um, Tourism Vancouver Island. And I'm wondering, this is maybe a question for staff. Um, it sounds like TVI is waiting for something. And I don't know if, if this board has um, the opportunity to give direction to TVI. Are we aware of any time when they'll come back to us um, with, their, um, with their annual plan? Um, Madam Chair, to answer the question, I, yeah, we're in a state of transition, and that's why I expressed some concern with suggesting we have an economic development officer on board. We don't, right? That uh, the regional district relied on CVEDS to provide economic development, tourist information services, and destination marketing by contract, and that contract was terminated at the end of August. The regional district is in the process of wrapping that up, up service up. Tourism Vancouver Island was providing a component of that, the tourist information. They will continue to do so till, till the end of the year for us, but we are relying on the service review that's being undertaken by the participants in that service to define what the role of the regional district will be moving forward. Now, that's not to say that we can uh, report back to you on the requests that have been made by the delegation today and take a look at the opportunities to move forward, but I just caution you that we don't have a service or staff or personnel necessarily. And we really are looking for the direction of the participants as to what level of service and cooperation or collaboration there may or may not be with respect to those those services that were previously provided by CVETS. Sure. Thanks for that clarification. Could I have a, a second okay. question? Um, I I really you know liked your the presentation's focus on on the importance of um, the arts and culture community. Um, and just one thing that I think um, you may have missed, or it's it's kind of become to the to the forefront um, lately with you know our recent election, is just the role in um, in the arts and culture sector in civic repair and and community building. And um, you you you've sort of mentioned like a um, you know having a place making. I think is so important. And I know um, Director Grieve uh, was spearheaded, you know, a project where we had um, musicians in the park and things like that are really, I think, essential for our community to come together, especially in times uh, post COVID or, you know, if you want to say we're during COVID. Um, so I really, I hope that we, and I, I concur with Director Arbor that we really do need to move forward and, and support um, arts much more because I think it plays a really important role in helping to mend um, a lot that has happened in our community over the last 18 to 20 months. So thank you for that. Thank you, Director Moran. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, just echoing some of the comments. Um, in terms of economic development, of course, uh, many of us have been trying to trying to get that word out there. Um, you know the impact of uh, the arts on um, economic. Uh, you know, helping the economy. I, I I've been participating a little bit in the Dig Arts um, events, and I know the Arts Impact Survey is coming out. Um, I'm assuming that some of the information that's captured in those results you've captured in this report um that's one question i have which obviously really shows a link to the um the economic piece oh i guess do we have we lost them no I, we're here oh, Dallas, sorry, do, you, I'm sorry. <laughs> do you want to answer that for uh, director warren uh, yes, in the presentation, we did reflect the results of the DIG survey um, uh, in uh, the numbers that we uh, presented, uh, those percentages, uh, they're captured there. Uh, we will be doing some further reporting on um, what work was done within that, uh, with Nordicity 
and the information gathered. Uh, they didn't get the amount of reach that they could have in our community. It was a very short time that it was presented mm -hmm. for it. So, um, uh, but good results nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know just because those results haven't been officially released, I, I wasn't quite sure. Um, and then just around the some of the programming that's happened with uh, some of the community outreach piece, I don't think that can be understated. I know Director Hamir um, brought that up, but I know just on a personal note, I, I had some of the art 30 day drawing kits um, delivered to some of uh, uh, a youth group that I do. And these were kids who were really isolated, lots of mental health issues, et cetera. And it was almost like a lifeline for those young people. And I know that our street population being involved in these things has been also very helpful to them. And of course, that this impacts the health of our whole community. And um, we don't see that, that maybe that has as much of an impact as it does um, because it's invisible to a point. But I just wanted to commend you for always thinking outside the box, which is of course what creatives do. Um, and, uh, and looking at how we can, um, you know, deal with things like a, a, glo a global pandem pandemic and, uh, and still try to have connection. Um, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to exploring this further and I thank you very much for your presentation today. Great, <clears throat> I don't see any further questions. So let's say thank you to our presenters today and um, just to let them know that we will be responding to their request at the next regular board meeting and uh, to thank them for this report and also their participation in the uh, task force um, last year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, directors. Thank you. Have a good evening. So all in favor of receipt? Anyone opposed? That's carried. Thank you. And that brings us to reports. And the first report is on the ministers meetings that were held during UBCM. So the Union of BC Municipalities Convention that just took place. Of course, oh, thank you, Dr. Arbor and Grant. And of course, there's uh, ministers meetings that go along uh, with that convention uh, the week previous. And so I just wanted to update the board on the meetings that were held. So we met with the Minister of Agriculture, Lana Popham, and that was really just a thank you to um, for the food hub uh, funding that we've received and uh, also to talk um, about our egg plan and some preliminary results um, out of that plan. Um, and one of the highlights of that was the um, on-farm water storage. And next we talked to the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, Ray Rankin. And that was an opportunity to familiarize the minister with the relationship that we're building with Comox First Nation and the partnerships that we are working on with them. And the next one was the Minister of Tourism, Arts and Culture, Melanie Mark. And we talked about our need for uh, infrastructure funding for facilities, um, the many upgrades that are required uh, to our sports and aquatic centers, and that uh, there wasn't really a, a good funding stream for that um, currently. So, um, we would benefit and other communities would also benefit from them having alternative funding streams um, for uh, capital for recreation facilities. And then the last meeting was with BC Hydro. Again, that was a thank you for all their help with our new water treatment facility. And that of course we had the grand opening today and that was a really wonderful event. So thank you all for attending. And are there any questions? Director Moore. I was just curious, Chair, if you wanted to mention a couple of your asks as well at the BC Hydro meeting that were kind of, <laughs> I'm not sure, but just flagging that. Yeah, so we did talk about um, uh, funding for green energy projects. And um, 
there was also a resolution from Cumberland regarding that um, at the CRC BCM. Um, and uh, there, there previously was funding streams for local governments to have a partnership with uh, BC Hydro so that they could do uh, green energy projects um, of all kinds, um, solar and um, micro hydro and geothermal. Um, but there is no such um, program. They did talk about how um, there is a surplus of energy um, uh, in the province currently. And so there likely won't be an opportunity for local governments to do those kind of partnerships in the near future. And we also have Site C coming online, um, which then will give um, even the province even more power. So unfortunately, um, there wasn't uh, too much opportunity, it looked like, on the horizon for us in that regard. Uh, with BC Hydro, we also talked about um, uh, electric vehicle uh, infrastructure. And so they did pass along a presentation that they um, had done recently for local governments um, regarding um, their planned uh, um, contribution to EV infrastructure in the province. And that was circulated to the board. Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair. I'm just curious if uh, your meeting with Mr. Rankin, Minister Rankin, uh, provided an opportunity to advocate uh, for the uh, Southlands uh, funding at all. Yeah, and because there's, um, you know, information of a sensitive nature, uh, we didn't uh, elaborate on that. But yes, that was one of the topics that was discussed with the minister. Good, thank you. Thanks. Director Grant. Yeah, thank you. We um, at the town had a meeting with um, one of the ministers, and I'm sorry, I was a bit late for the meeting, so I didn't catch the name of the person, but I think it was transportation. And we're looking to put a bike path or a multi-use path down Lazo Road, um, which we've got well, we've got the land and everything's ready to go. Um, and we suggested that it would be nice if they were to run that all the way around Point Homes and all the way up to the airport. Um, the minister said that they're looking very closely at widening the shoulder of the road so that we can actually get a proper bike route through that area and suggested that if we could get the area B rep on board, that that would probably be well. And they were looking in, in the next few years. It wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't way out in the future. So uh, I would add that to the list and hopefully we can get the okay to do that. Yeah, that sounds like good news. Thank you. And Director Arbor. Yeah, well, you have the Area A director on board, not that it matters, but uh, <laughs> I, it, and this will, uh, this will probably be included in our discussion of the active transportation network later in, on today, but a uh, great initiative. And I just wanted to say thank you because I, uh, to the staff, because staff support a lot of these meetings and to the chair, I think it's really good that uh, we took those meetings. Um, not in person, all on, on, the, on the phone actually it was a bit of a challenge in the one I, I partook. Uh, but uh, in the case of recreation, again, with the support of, of Doug DeMarzo and, and um, we honed in on to some really key issues, I think in the province and it, it, was, it was really good to have those discussions. So thanks to staff and the chair for organizing these. Thank you. And I don't see any further questions. So all in favor of receipt. Anyone opposed? And that's carried, thank you. We're on to item two, which is the Comox Valley Recreation Commission minutes from August 24th. Hillian and Cole Hampton, thank you. Any discussion on the minutes? Okay, all in favor of receipt. Anyone opposed? And that's carried. On to item three, the Comox Valley Regional Transit Service expansions. Arbor and Grant, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors, and Mike Zavarsky, Manager of uh, Transit Facilities, is here to present this report and the recommendations that are provided to you and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Russell. Through the uh, Chair to the Board, uh, good afternoon. I'll just give you a quick verbal overview of my staff report here. Um, so annually, as you recall, we have a process with BC Transit where they request our confirmation uh, of what kinds of expansions we're interested in supporting over the next few years. That's called the Transit Improvement Program or TIP. Uh, we've received the latest TIP from BC Transit and it recommends three years of conventional transit expansions as well as custom, custom being like handy dart and community bus. 
uh, on the conventional side of things, they're recommending 2,500 hours per year. And that's in line with achieving our transit mode share target of 3%, which was identified in the transit future plan. Uh, on the custom transit, they've recommended uh, some handy dart improvements basically to align the handy dart system with our conventional system as far as the span during the day. So extending it into the evening as well as um, holiday service. So allowing handy dart to operate on some of the SAT holidays. And they've also recommended a, a bit of a redo of the community bus 21, 22 areas, which are kind of underperforming. So looking at making some, some improvements to that as well. So that's what they're asking for us to support. Staff have reviewed that and we're recommending that the conventional transit expansions not be supported at this time. There's a number of uh, other initiatives that are ongoing that should be considered further before we make decisions on, on conventional transit. So the transit infrastructure study being one of them, looking at our exchanges and our transit priority measures. Um, the transit future action plan, which is gonna start up again in uh, probably January uh, of 2022. The transportation alternatives assessment, which is underway right now and uh, will be the subject of a November elected officials forum. Uh, the Fisheri Bridge project is obviously still affecting transit and, and transportation across the valley. So wait until that's kind of wrapped up. And then we already have a, an expansion that the board approved um, in the last year's TIP, uh, which will go out on the road in March, 2022. So getting those things kind of further along or complete would be, um, would be great before we could consider any more conventional transit expansions. Staff are recommending that we do support the custom transit expansions, um, starting with the first year as kind of the firm commitment, and that being for evening service, uh, extending evening service. So currently the handy dart service ends at 4.30. So this would extend that later in the evening. We haven't really determined exactly how late, but hopefully as late as possible. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, first we have Dr. Arbor. Yeah, thanks. I, I think it's so thoughtful of staff to actually uh, part the conventional transit for all the reason you, you uh, you outline with the transit future plan. And we asked a question about uh, our pace in submitting on the infrastructure piece. And, and I don't know uh, the feedback from the municipalities and all that stuff for a big grant. And I know there's been a buzz around that in the region, but I think it's wise to, to just wait to look at, at the range of transportation things that is before us right now, before actually deciding whether that's the money allocation we wanna do on that specific pieces that BC Transit is recommending. And I think it's also for the amounts of money for the uh, the handy dart system to uh, smoothen things out. Now I'm sure staff is aware of a couple of issues I have in area in regards to that one. And I'm not sure this will solve it, but uh, um, uh, I, I'm in support of doing those small adjustments regarding handy dart to improve the service. So I'm fully in support of both recommendations. Thanks. Thank you. Director Cole Hamilton. Yes. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, uh, Mike, for the report. Um, overall, it seems to me like it's good value for money. It allows us to, you know, align our level of service to uh, the, the handy dart with the conventional bus service and uh, redesign two community bus lines. It's, um, and I can also see the logic in wanting to see the current projects in place and before and consolidate that before uh, building on. I just had one question, which is on, on I think it's table one. Um, I was just trying to make sense of the figures there. Uh, I wasn't sure if you've listed custom for each year, whether that's a la carte, like the 2023 figures just for the 500 hours and the 2024 is for 600 hours. Um, whether, whether, whether the CVRD annual cost includes just the first piece in the first year and then the first and second pieces in the second year and all three in the third year. Um, yeah, so that that is, the cost for each of those individually. So if we wanted to add more than one of those, we would have to add up the costs. Right. If that makes sense. And, and this will be the, annual costs. Sorry. And the reason that they're placed in separate years is they would be a staggered implementation is correct. Right? So one, two, and three. So the the yeah, the, the annual cost for 2025 would be the 1480, 885, 18054, and 3157 added together because we would have all three services in place at, in 2025. 
in 2025, I, I put it in the financial factors section, the annual cost for all of the expansions, 590,883. Um, that would be for both conventional and, right. and custom. I was I just needing to look at the custom actually. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't uh, total just the custom. Um, but yeah, I mean the 14 plus the 18 plus the three. So if somebody's better at math than I am. There you go. So roughly 35. Okay, <laughs> still still a great deal. I just wanted to just clarify yeah. the relationship between those numbers. Yeah, so at the end of implementing all of those in, in those phases, we would be looking at about $35,000 extra per year. And that's net of additional revenue from fares, et cetera. Correct. Okay, great. Just wanted to clarify that, but I'm still fully in support. Thanks. Thank you, Director Hamir. Thanks, Hanson. I'm also, you know, really in support of these community buses and more of the um, tailored um, transit options for uh, rural communities. I think that's where we probably really lack a lot of support um, from our um, our electorate um, in participation. And and so hopefully by you know these custom um, routes will will help with that. Um, you know, this topic did come up quite a bit in sort of the the offline conversations during UBCM. It's pointed out to me that um, Gabriola has a, a bus um, on, on the island called, called Gertie. And I was thinking of Hornby's bus and that we should name it Hurdy. So that, you know, it would be a, a nice compliment to their to their bus route. So I, I just want to put it out there to Director Arbor area. You know, a rename could really help with that. But it, all joking aside, I think just the um, the uptake of, of um, the Hornby bus and that um, something that comes from the communities is so um, important. And, and whatever partnerships that we can look like look at, I think I just encourage staff to um, to uh, work work with the community as much as possible. So thanks. Thank you. And back to you, Dr. Arbor. Yeah, it's, it's too bad I don't represent Bowen Island because then we could replace the T for an N and it would become Bernie. <laughs> but um, in regards to, I had a hidden question, uh, which was, uh, it, it didn't get picked up at the time. It's just a quick update because I'm so interested in the infrastructure uh, grant that we're, uh, application that we're trying to pull together between all the municipalities. Since we have you on stage, I, I thought I would indulge and, and ask whether we can have a brief status on that as well. Yeah, sorry, I didn't um, answer that previously. I um, We are hoping to hear back from each municipality in September on their approval and principle of the kind of locations and concepts that were identified in the transit infrastructure study. So we did those presentations earlier in the summer and we've started to have some dialogue with staff uh, at each municipality to just make sure that they're kind of on board and, and solicit that council support uh, on those locations. So hopefully by the end of September or, or October that we've heard back from each of them and then BC Transit would kind of facilitate that grant application. Um, so we're still working towards that. Great, thank you. I don't see any further, <clears throat> excuse me, any further questions. So all in favor of receipt, anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thank you, Mike. Uh, recommendation one moved by Hillian, seconded by Arbor. Any further discussion? All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Recommendation two moved by Cole Hamilton and seconded by Arbor. Any further discussion? All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thank you very much. We're on to item four, the Regional Active Transportation Network Plan. Sure. McCollum and Grant, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Alana Mullaley will introduce this uh, network plan in the staff report and the consultant that will uh, provide some background information and answer questions. Good afternoon through Madam Chair to the directors. I'm here to talk to you today about the completion of the Regional Active Transportation Network Plan. It's a big day. <laughs> I'm happy that the topic has already come up through some of your commentary. 
Um, I'm just going to give a, a little brief overview, and then we also have our consultant, Dan Casey, from Urban Systems to get in and dig into the plan with you and, and respond to some of the questions that I'm sure you'll have. So as you know, this is a project that we undertook as a regional initiative, so thank you very much to the Municipal Councils for supporting that and the Electoral Area Directors. We uh, undertook the work in order to advance some of our key regional growth strategy goals around public health, climate change, and transportation. The project, as you might recall, did receive some funding from the Ministry of Transportation and has been structured in such a way as to be consistent with the Provincial Active Transportation Plan, as well as the Provincial Design Guidelines. Proactive Coordinated Active Transportation Planning is a key component of developing a multimodal transportation system here in the Valley that will help us to reduce our GHG emissions and establish a more level playing field for our residents in the way that we move around the valley, whether it's our trips to work, to school, or to the many services and amenities that we are blessed with. So in this way, the plan and its implementation support a number of your initiatives, not the least of which are the work of the Airshed Roundtable and the, the draft strategy, Airshed strategy, that we'll be coming to you with later in, in the coming months and the Poverty Reduction Plan, which we'll be bringing back to you in just a, a couple of short weeks in October. The Active Transportation Network Plan lays out a clear framework with some distinct priorities around pedestrian infrastructure, cycling infrastructure, and then multi-use infrastructure, so the kind of infrastructure that Director Grant just referenced uh, in respect to LASO. The priorities reflect significant input from our community, both the general community and those who are working very actively uh, or have been over the last decades and, and continue on advancing active transportation initiatives within our community. And also from public landowners and agencies uh, within whose jurisdiction um, active transportation lies. So this is um, a framework for us to consider how we can coordinate our investments and our advocacy efforts to senior level government um, for example, for funding opportunities, how we can show that we put some our regional hats on to think about how these projects are going to best serve us in advancing our vision of a multimodal transportation system for the Valley. The recommendations in front of you, um, I'm happy to return to once you've had Dan's presentation, but, but in a nutshell, I'm asking for your authorization to proceed with our next steps, being the implementation agreements that we'd like to use to advance these projects. And perhaps the LAZO project referenced by Director Grant is one of the first ones we'll start with, with your staff and, and with ministry staff. I've talked a little bit about implementation agreements at this table in the past, and essentially they are a tool afforded to us under the RGS legislation. And that's when we really hammer out the details of how we're gonna get this stuff done. So how are we gonna pay for it? Who's gonna own it? Who's gonna maintain it? Um, all of those really important pieces that get us from plan to users. So I'd like your authorization to enable us to start those uh, conversations with your staff and find those windows of opportunity. So for example, your staff are doing capital planning work right now. Uh, you're looking at different initiatives through your budgets. You're thinking about how to spend community works funds, et cetera, et cetera. And we'd like to be able to dig in with your staff to, to find those opportunities. I would also like your authorization to start to pursue some opportunities with some of our community partners. Um, you'll, you might re recall receiving a presentation from the Comox Valley Cycling Commission at the outset of this project. Did I say commission? Sorry, I meant coalition. Cycling coalition at the outset of this project, talking about the priorities that that network has identified over years of use. Um, so we would like uh, authorization to work with some community partners, such as the coalition, to start to build an active uh, transportation culture, which is one of the goals identified in the plan. And by that, I mean finding ways to support all of the good works that are already happening. So for example, uh, the active transportation school plans that, that, that the school district works on with community partners, um, some of the outreach and education workshops the Cycling Coalition already offers. Um, so that's the second part of our recommendation today. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dan Casey. Many of you will already know Dan. He's, he's worked closely with City of Courtney on developing um, Courtney's, helping to develop Courtney's transportation plan, and certainly with us here in on um, electoral area initiatives. Uh, Dan is our lead consultant with Urban Systems, and he is here today, as I said, to report sort of the nitty gritty of, of the report, including digging into the priority projects with you, and will help to respond uh, to any questions that arise for you. 
and he is online and Lisa, he, if he, if you can load his presentation, that would be good. Otherwise he can share his screen, whichever works best. Thank you, Alana. You should be able to share, Dan. Okay, great. Oh, I'm getting a host disabled uh, screen sharing message. Okay, we'll try again from this side. Sure. That looks How, better. Okay, great. Okay, so just let me know when uh, we can all see a title slide here. There should be a series of local organization logos. Yes, we see it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Alana, for that introduction. And thank you, um, everyone, for allowing us to be here today to give you a, it really is just going to be a brief summary of the uh, final active transportation network plan. We'll touch on some of the key pieces around uh, the framework for the plan, the, the vision, the goals, and then we'll move into some of the, uh, the key network recommendations and implementation pieces. So we'll start with the vision. Uh, a vision was developed specifically uh, for this document and for active transportation throughout Comox Valley. The vision reads, the Comox Valley's active transportation network will be safe and comfortable for people of all ages and abilities. The integrated and connected network will facilitate a cultural shift towards sustainable transportation modes, thereby reducing regional greenhouse gas emissions. Walking will be a first choice for shorter trips, while cycling and transit will be convenient choices for longer trips. So this is the vision that guides both um, the active transportation network plan, as well as uh, helps articulate what the active transportation network looks like upon successful implementation. Six goals were identified and refined throughout the process of developing this plan. So the six goals generally, uh, goal one is around uh, safe transportation choices uh, available to all people. Goal two is around observing a significant shift towards sustainable transportation to support a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Goal three, promoting a culture and promoting uh, active transportation throughout the valley. Alana touched on this a moment ago. Goal four, creating more places for people to walk, roll, or bicycle. Goal five, establishing an inclusive and accessible active transportation network for all residents and visitors. And goal six, coordinate and maintain a regional multimodal transportation network. So these goals guide uh, the process that was undertaken as well as the key outcomes and recommendations from the active transportation network plan. Um, a fairly extensive inventory of current conditions and current facilities was undertaken. This uh, involved both understanding how uh, people currently move around the valley, as well as the infrastructure that's in place um, across all modes, but very specifically for active transportation modes uh, as well. Um, the network plan on the right hand side of the screen here is showing uh, location of um, current facilities, whether um, cycling or trail facilities in rural areas, municipal cycling facilities as well as some of the key origin and destination uh, locations throughout, throughout the valley, places where people are making trips to and from. A few key stats uh, shown on the screen as well. There are over 200 kilometers of local trails throughout the valley. Uh, there's about one, uh, 1,100 kilometers of, of roadway, and um, approximately 70% of that is contained within rural areas. And then in, uh, a sample photo shown uh, top center of the screen, which really um, highlights a common condition on rural roads throughout the valley, that being um, a very basic provision of, of roadside active transportation facilities. So a very basic shoulder provision or, or, or very often uh, nothing in place. Some precedent photos also showing conditions uh, in place currently. And so we see a photo of the great one spot trail. We see um, some of the multi-use trail signage that's in place to help guide residents uh, throughout the trail system. And we see some uh, sort of varying provision of, of, of shoulder facilities alongside some of the rural roads. So a, a number of um, network plans are included in the ATNP document. I'll walk through some of the key ones here and really they're about guiding future implementation and future investment in active transportation facilities. 
there's a long-term active transportation network. It identifies future active transportation corridors in the rural areas. It represents, if we took all of these lines in total, they represent the full build out of this network, but really what they're intended to do is to guide implementation along the way. And so we start to see positive incremental change toward realizing this uh, overall network. A regional active transportation network has been identified. And really what this is about is identifying regional corridors of significance. And those really being uh, corridors that facilitate trip making that are sort of regional or even interregional in nature. They provide connections to uh, key regional centers and key employment areas. They're aligned, uh, importantly, they're aligned with existing and planned facilities in both the urban and rural areas. So this network does pick up on both um, CVRD's past network planning, as well as network planning undertaken uh, by the municipalities. And the idea is that this is to help present and help guide um, regional investments and regional priorities in a, into a coordinated network. <laughs> The network plan shown on the screen to the right is, put, are, is titled the pedestrian uh, development areas. And so the idea is this map highlights areas in the rural areas where pedestrian facility development is to be focused. These are areas either that are currently um, uh, inhabited or where future growth uh, is, um, is intended and guided through um, regional growth strategy and rural LCP. And the idea here is that these pick up on uh, locations in rural areas where, where individuals would uh, like to be walking and uh, reflect areas of uh, residential population as well as uh, activity nodes such as schools and community centers. And then lastly, um, the priority projects. And so we went through a process of understanding these long-term networks uh, that I, uh, many of which I just, I just walked the group through and recognizing there's a lot of work to be done before we recognize, before we realize the full build out of those longer term networks. We went through a process, both um, technical, where we had a number of criteria um, that were used to help uh, determine which, which projects, which improvements should be highest priority, as well as working with uh, the community and specific stakeholder groups to help um, to help prioritize a list of, of 24 priority projects. So very specifically, uh, prioritization was based on community feedback and stakeholder conversation. Uh, they represent routes that provide access to key destinations such as uh, residential areas and commercial areas, schools, community centers, and bus stops. They're areas that address a network gap and help link up uh, either existing or future facilities. Uh, they, they represent routes of regional significance that connect the municipalities, Comox First Nation and rural areas. Uh, they address safety concerns and last they align with the pedestrian development areas that I just introduced earlier. So the map on the right is highlighting those 24 priority projects. They are um, coded as uh, projects A through X. Those do not represent uh, sequencing or priority ordering. They are north to south. And you'll see three different line types on there. Uh, pink being pedestrian facility, uh, red being cycling facilities, and green being multi-use. And so in the full active transportation network plan document, there's um, a table that uh, for each, each uh, lettered project on the map provides uh, location, um, distance, a bit of a description of, of what the improvement might be and a, and a high level cost estimate. And that all that detailed information is all contained in the plan. Lastly, wanted to touch on uh, the importance of regional coordination or regional cooperation when it comes to starting to realize some of the um, uh, network implementation that's highlighted in the plan. So implement implementation is obviously very key that happening both at the uh, regional district level as well as through partnerships with um, whether it's uh, municipalities, Comox First Nation, whether it's provincial or even federal agencies as well as some of the service providers of transportation within Comox Valley. Uh, monitoring of conditions over time is, is going to be extremely important, both in understanding um, the needs of people uh, seeking to travel by active modes, but also in evaluating how effective investments in this infrastructure uh, have been. And so the plan does frame up uh, 
a framework for undertaking that monitoring. And it's suggested that that occur at the regional level with uh, obviously uh, local jurisdictions alongside its partners. And then uh, also of importance is partnerships. And this has themes both through implementation and monitoring as well as through funding. And so the feeling being through this document that it's gonna take um, collaboration locally especially working to uh, through the prioritization that's been done in this plan is to really um, start to um, gain momentum and gain focus on a more select number of possible improvements to put yourself in a really good position to start to advocate for um, external funding, whether provincially, federally, or otherwise. So with that, I will conclude and um, we'll, uh, we'll remain on the line for any um, questions you might have. Thank you. Great, thank you. And we do have some questions, starting with Director Arbor. Thank you. If the board will indulge once in a while, I have lots of detailed comments and feedback. And uh, this is really positive. I think it's uh, amongst my very top reports of the entire term in terms of uh, reading through it and, uh, and the public engagement and thoughtfulness and to where you land on the priorities. Um, to me, it's the equivalent of when we did when the regional district did the park strategy a number of years ago in 2013, I guess, really gave a roadmap for us to pursue with some unknowns, some question marks, but really have such a great network plan. And uh, obviously, I look more closely at the area A um, components, which, uh, again, I, I agreed both with the future opportunities around the uh, ENN corridor in the longer term, and there was a couple of pages dedicated to that uh, on the active transportation side. And then the more um, sooner priorities. And one recommendation that I appreciated, which uh, Alana talked about in her uh, preamble, was, um, you know, as we look at capital projects and others, because in area A, some of the projects I was like, oh, you know, does it make a, a difference if uh, we put sewer in and then we do the work, road work at the same time and questions like that that popped into my mind for some of the areas. Yesterday we voted uh, and then there's opportunistic stuff right that's not necessarily in the plan, but it was testing my brain because we just put in a little section of trail on the ENN and on third street in Union Bay. And then yesterday I voted for water main replacement. <laughs> so is there an opportunity again to improve the pedestrian or cycling aspect as these things come up? So make sure that there's interdepartmental conversations as those things arise um, and that flex in the plan. I thought the, uh, in, um, you know, like there was one item 14.6 million for highway 19 between Union Bay and Buckley Bay. They've actually, the province already once done one side of the road. So hopefully the it's in their plans to do the other side. That would be a, a nice one. Uh, some that are, I think, perennial in Royston, uh, the two smaller projects, 600 and 900, I, th I think in area that'd be a great place to start. I had to see if we can pull partnerships around those. Those in the community have been uh, on the radar for the long term, for a long time in terms of better connecting the school in a safe manner, having that, that safety element um, and, uh, and walkability and cycling. So I thought, I thought of all the variety, I was kind of honing in on that one. The one around Union Bay, so compelling and a couple of million bucks though around the, you know, the main section, really compelling project against for pedestrian multi-use, but probably harder to achieve with the resources we have. And, uh, and lastly, maybe one missing. So I, uh, you know, it stops at X, but in terms of Y, one, one maybe feedback for the consultant and staff I don't know if this came up, but one that I'm aware of for a long time is Ships Point to community, uh, to the community hall. Uh, so from Ships Point Road between Tozer and the community hall. This is an area that I continue to receive complaints around speeding and bad shoulders and all that. And there's 250 homes at, at Ships Point and many of them do go to the hall and we just built in the playground. So I would probably add that on the list. Um, my last point and question mark, which I'm sure staff has as well, is, is just really going back to the funding that we don't have a specific funding for this that's either regional or in the rural areas, especially in the rural areas, we require a collaboration with MOTI. And there'll be a lot of competing demands for community works from our friends at the engineering department. So, um, 
So for me, it's, it's maybe not for today, but I found that the recommendation of the funding was not giving me a path to actually feel we could come up with the 400 million to fund the entire network plan, realizing a lot of it will come from the province and, and grants, but even to get started. And my question is, has there been consideration for the rural areas or as part of the regional park service to look at the parks function uh, around creating envelopes of money that at least have because I know on Denman, we use community works to do incremental building of the Cross Island Trail. We do a little bit every year. And I would love for the rural areas at least to have a little bit of seed funding that we can look at so that, you know, it's not just dreams, that there's actually some pots of funds that we can access to get projects such as the Royston one going and things like that. So again, brilliant job by... Uh, everything, the process. I'm super impressed and super thrilled that the Comox Valley now has that plan. Thank you. Thank you. Director McCollum. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thank you very much for the report on presentation down in Milana. Um, I think what I was first struck by is just how daunting um, <laughs> the amount of um, projects that we have outlined here. And I mean, I think the $400 million that's um that's mentioned and then just a few pages later that it's also equivalent to the entire national active transportation <laughs> grant availability currently is it actually really does put it in perspective just um how difficult it is to uh implement um active transportation especially out of outside of municipal boundaries where we don't have a clear capital funding path forward um, so I think that's probably my first thought is just that um, we have a lot of work out of us, um, but generally I'm, I'm quite happy with it. It also occurs to me that there is um, different needs being met in different areas and in our implementation plan, we, we don't really try and categorize or prioritize those needs, but some of these um, some of these projects really go a long way to provide some linkages in the network and provide, you know, uh, destination like I'm thinking um, uh, like project D is, you know, extends the one spot trail, which people really go out of their way for on a, on a recreational level, tourism level. And maybe there's options there in terms of grants from ice tea or ones that are more directed at bringing people to the area. Uh, and then others are really more about safety, especially when it comes to um, projects that have been identified near our rural schools. And then uh, something that we have less information about is just which of these routes um, have higher demands in terms of um, current users and then, um, you know, overall safety that would be delivered from some of these. And so I think there is definitely some work ahead in terms of um, trying to pick our priorities and which ones um, we want to invest our time in trying to um, get funding for. Uh, another thing that occurred to me while we we're receiving the presentation is that um, currently um, Basically, what we have is shoulders that Modi may or may not maintain, uh, depending on the time of year, and then um, basically trails that are in our park system. So, uh, if you know, if we're successful in building these out, it's it occurs to me that um, we still have a problem to solve there in terms of um, yeah, exactly as was outlined in the report, maintenance and and where that uh, responsibility for those um, created assets will lie. Um, one question I had um, that came out of this was that one of the recommendations was for a technical advisory committee to be formed, and I noticed that wasn't completely the recommendation that came through um, from staff, and I'm just wondering if, um, if, uh, if that's basically one in the same or if that's something that we would look toward. I feel there was a bit of a missed um, piece of engagement with KFN and that there's two very important linkages that um, are in their jurisdiction that aren't, aren't really outlined in the plan. Um, but uh, I think one is actually in the, on the map for the um, CV network plan, but not in the um, priority list. And um, I think it would be really important for us to have regular engagement with KFN as we, as we go forward. And I'm just wondering if staff wanna comment. Through Madam Chair to Director McCollum, thank you very much for those questions. Um, a couple of pieces I'll, I'll just keep track of. Um, 
Uh, agreed, Dante, but but I think good to have a, a clear set of priorities that the community has invested in and, and technical stakeholders. I think you've nailed it when you're suggesting, when, I, when I'm inferring that you're suggesting that it's, it's really important to look at these projects and the funding for them through multiple lenses. So if we think about active transportation as reaching goals around economic development, public health, GHG emissions, et cetera, then that I think can, can help us think more broadly about how, how we should pitch these projects for funding. And then similarly, how these projects fit into the, the capital plans that each of the municipalities um, and then the provincial agencies have. So I, th I think you've nailed it. Uh, the monitoring and evaluation piece, you know, how are we gonna keep track of these pieces? I think we've, we've started to develop some tools around the regional growth strategy monitoring and, and you'll soon be seeing um, an ArcGIS site come from us and we've got big hopes about how that that tool can help us track uh, progress and where the opportunities lie. Um, the technical advisory, you might recall that one of the strategic priorities you gave us was to use the regional growth strategy and that group, it's called the technical advisory committee in the plan, but really the way that you know, we kind of interpret that is that in the past, those have been your, your planning reps, but certainly on something like this, my thinking would be that we, that is an existing framework that we could use. And when it would be important to bring in your other key staff people, your engineering staff, your park staff, et cetera, that that would be the framework that we could use. And so, uh, you know, Dan and I talked about the, the value of reintroducing a new concept, but, but it was actually, um, you know, maybe I was wrong, but I think we, what we'd like to do is test the use of that existing uh, body and then bringing in those key players as we need it. And then reaching out to the key community partners when we need help or, on the monitoring piece, for example, Cycling Coalition has has um, expressed interest in, in helping us out with monitoring the use of some of these routes so that that could help us to present priorities uh, to you. On Comox First Nation, Comox First Nation uh, was a partner in the project. And part of the reason that we wanted to really flesh out the distinction between uh, the future projects and the priority projects now is about uh, helping KFN in whatever way we can or not helping but supporting KFN to affirm their rights and, and treaty and so really recognizing that some of those key routes condensed street back road um, the dike road that's really going to be uh, you know KFN's lead not to say that they're responsible for the project but we really want to be able to take their advice on how those lands uh, could or could not potentially um, fit into this work so I couldn't agree more Thank you. That's that's great. Thanks for that answer, and I think that clarification with KFN is really helpful. I don't, I, I don't, I, I did read in the report, um, you know, those opportunities, but it wasn't clear to me that they were um, intimately involved with it. So, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Dan and Alana for the presentation. I, I like Director Arbor's. Uh, is really pleased and impressed with this report. And I, um, I guess I wanted to just briefly just echo a point that uh, Director McCollum was making. And I think there's a very high price tag there, but I think when one considers the, the co-benefits mode, not just mode share, but the health, tourism, and other aspects, um, the costs then start to become more reasonable as one considers the gains that are there. And hopefully that would also open up the range of uh, possible funding sources beyond just sort of the strict transportation piece. Um, I had one really uh, simple question, which is that I, um, it wasn't mentioned specifically in the report, but I see all the prices quoted are for both sides of the road on the accessible shoulders, uh, one on each side. Okay, that's great. And the other one was, I think there'll be quite a lot of interest in the community about this plan. And uh, while I realize it's early days, it would be helpful to have maybe just a very broad sort of sense of what the timeline might be and when first projects might actually sort of, um, you know, shovels might go into the ground. I'm, I'm guessing it's a, uh, years probably, and like, or, or um, just be interested to just to get um, Alana for a sense of what the timeline might, might look like. Um, through Madam Chair to the directors, I think we would like to get going as soon as we can. And so having your authorization to proceed with those implementation agreements, I think will put us in a good position to think about actual timing relative to the projects that you have underway in, in the municipal areas and then relative to anything that the ministry has in the hopper. So just to come back again to Director Grant's point about Lazo Road, we know that there's significant opportunity to piggyback in there. 
Um, and so we'd like to take advantage of something like that as the opportunity arise. So uh, Dr. Arbor said, you know, opportunistic plus some detailed capital planning work. Um, that's what we'd like to embark on. And we'll come back to you and, and, and to confirm, like, is this the right time? So uh, is, is it a good idea to throw in an active transportation, maybe as a side benefit to some of the big capital initiatives that are underway with engineering? Is, is that a icing on the cake for that community or is that a detraction? Thank you. I see Director Grieve has his hand up. Director Grieve, are you there? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I think what needs to be understood by the municipal directors at this table is that us in the regional uh, rural areas are not masters of our own house. Uh, we see where over 700 kilometers exist of roadway. Um, and I think, uh, you know, where this thing breaks down is uh, at the operations level of, uh, of MOTI. I mean, even back in when I first got elected, uh, Kevin Falcon was the minister and a very avid cyclist. And he was making all kinds of noises about, you know, creating cycling shoulders on the roads and whatever. But my God, that was like, you know, 12, 13 years ago. And it's, it's not from the high level, ministerial level. Where it breaks down is when it gets down to the mid management level of MOTI. And the fact that they're not engaged in the community, they don't think in terms of community benefits. Uh, look no further than when they put the, the new bridge across the Solom River. Uh, a lot of work went into that. We were going to have a, a trail uh, between the exhibition ground across the river. There'd be a multi-use trail for equestrian bicycles and whatever. And at the 11th hour, we got word from the ministry that, oh no, they've decided to save some money and pull that approach to the bridge right off the table to save $250,000. Well, the area, the, the reps for area B and area C stumped up the money when those dump trucks were running to build those approaches and make it happen. So, you know, I think when you talk about pro progressing on, on the real simple issues like, like proper shoulders and what have you, it has to be built into their psyche built into their culture um, because uh, it, it frequently you end up with those kind of reneging on, on, on promises because they do not, they're not, they don't see the connection to the community is not their issue. Um, I would say though, that with the highways, the local highways are very open, very res respectful, very aware of what's going on. Um, look at the, the new uh, uh, paving in, uh, in Black Creek. Uh, and it's, it's phenomenal. There's all kinds of shoulders there. So 19A looks, looks much, much better. So they have to put it in. So it's, it's part of their checklist. And until it gets to that point and becomes an operations issue that, that we're not really going to see the cooperation because the rest of it, frankly, is a lot of blather. Thank you. Thanks for that. Next, we have Director Morin. Um, I, I wanted to bring up the, the aspect of, of safety. I know it's outlined in the report in terms of um, collisions between pedestrians and cyclists and vehicles and cyclists, et cetera. Um, recently in Courtney, we adopted some uh, safety signage as a pilot in a couple areas on some of our um, multimodal paths um, because they've increased in traffic by so much which is a great thing um and that was more around sharing the path and you know being conscious that there you may have cyclists pedestrians someone in a motorized scooter someone with a stroller you know you name it um on on a path but i wanted to uh ask about addressing other safety um issues such as i know you know the galloping goose trail as an example has had a lot of safety concerns. Um, and of course we have many uh, proposed ideas in rural areas, but also on multi-use paths that are not close to a lot of people and there can be some significant safety concerns. And, and that kind of, um, I think, uh, 
defeat some of the purpose in people wanting to use those paths. So I guess I'm just curious how those kinds of things are addressed in terms of of safety that may be because it's an isolated area or um, you know, just don't have uh, maybe a little bit less traffic in some of those areas. So, so people are, are quite isolated. Um, and so I just wondered in terms of, of sort of best practice or, or whatever, looking at things like accessibility is always factored in. Um, but in, I wondered about this other kind of safety lens that's a little bit different than what's outlined in the report. Through Madam Chair, Dan, I wonder if you can um, speak to Director Moran's question around safety, particularly in isolated areas when you've got maybe lone users, but also users who might encounter other non-active transportation uses on the same trail. Yeah, happy to. And then through the chair to uh, Director Moran, um, thank you for the question. And um, um, I have had the chance to work uh, a little bit lately on exactly this on the Galloping Goose Trail in Greater Victoria, which has been um, a nice piece of experience for myself personally. I use the trail a lot also. Lighting is a big component to it, um, especially when we're looking in sort of more built up urban areas. In rural areas, typically, um, not only is it costly to, to do something like that over long distances, um, the uh, lighting as a utility and, and who's gonna operate that is also a challenge. Um, it also really can have the tendency to take away from that rural character, which is what people um, tend to gravitate toward these facilities for in the first place. I think other components, there's a, um, a, an approach called SEPTED. It's um, an acronym that really speaks to creating spaces that uh, are visible, uh, can be seen from uh, others that might not be on the facility itself and have the ability to... Um, um, uh, seek refuge if you needed to in the case of an instance where you felt uncomfortable. I think um, overall though, like the, the rural nature of some of these trails is what makes them uh, neat and unique and desirable, but also as exactly as you're pointing out, can come with the challenge of how do you create a space that um, is safe and, and almost as importantly, feels safe so that people want to use it. That's a real challenge. Sorry, what was the acronym that you <laughs> crime prevention through environmental design cpted septed our profession admittedly is just littered with uh, these acronyms that are <laughs> pretty jargony we love them yeah and <laughs> could i just have, have a subsequent around you know what we've put into a kind of a pilot in courtney around um that safety signage that's about sharing, you know, sharing the paths and things like that. Could you speak to any ex experience that you have or recommendations in that regard in, in terms of more like a heavily used um, path that, that uh, you may have more conflicts between pedestrians and cyclists or, or whatever? Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and again, through the chair, um, all sorts of examples of this um, from other communities. And what you start to see is where the need for these sorts of um, uh, preventative, uh, whether it's campaigns or treatments come in, it is an indication that the trails are successful. There are, there are enough users, enough different user types and enough people using the trails that these conflicts are happening. And so that's you know demonstrating that, that the trails are, are being well used, which is great. I think what we do see um, in other communities, uh, signage efforts um, alongside signage efforts would be um, targeted, uh, probably not uh, full-time, but targeted um, enforcement, whether that's enforcement in the form of actually enforcing or more around uh, relaying the message that the intent of the signage or of the regulation applied to the trail is. Um, we do see in other communities also, you start to see um, uh, whether, you know, full scale or just partial separation of facilities where there might be, um, you know, a certain portion of the trail that's uh, um, softer surface, suitable for uh, hiking, equestrian activities, that sort of thing. You might see a harder packed surface right alongside it uh, that might be meant more for, um, you know, uh, cyclists. 
and that would be signed and that would be messaged and even information on your own web services and things goes a long way to um, helping people understand the nature of the conflicts and how they're meant to, to use those facilities. Great, thank you. Thank you, Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair. Um, really appreciate the discussion uh, and, and the excellent report. Um, I, I wanted uh, some help with um, just understanding more fully the, um, the list of um, future opportunities and um, the distinction between that and the priority projects. In particular, it seems that um, many of those involved having a significant partnership, particularly uh, Comox First Nation is one that stands out. And is that the primary reason why we, we can't identify some of those as uh, priority projects because it is in fact dependent on another uh, uh, government uh, to, to move forward together? Through Madam Chair to Dr. Hillian. Yes, that was one of the key pieces that emerged through the consultation and the feedback from the public. The other one would be the ENN corridor, uh, or, or maybe the key one that we heard about through the public feedback was the value of that corridor um, and its great potential to address so many of the um, uh, the locations that, that folks were looking for. So, uh, you know, having that role for Comox First Nation to identify their interest and, and what they would like to see on a priority uh, trail or corridor like that would be would be a, a good reason for thinking about this as a future. Not to say, and, and Dan jump in here, but not to say that these things couldn't happen sooner rather than later if the parties were able to come together and work on those solutions, but rather just the recognition that um, sort of to Director Greaves' point that with the CBRD not being able to be in the driver's seat, uh, requiring some, some really concerted and deliberate collaboration to make these pieces happen. Dan, would you um, add anything? Great, great explanation. I think the, the one other thing I would, I would add is that these corridors were identified as um, very important through our stakeholder chats, through our community chats. And really the way they've been framed up in the document is so that if and when the time comes to pursue these, they're not lost as important ideas. And so, well, we can't necessarily, you know, go out with each of these next year, we'll say, because there are jurisdictional and coordination challenges. We don't want to lose track of them. They're important. And so that's how they've been framed up in the document. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, the, the one in particular that uh, has come to my attention quite frequently in, in the recent years is condensory roads. And uh, uh, given some of the uh, changes uh, with servicing at the bridge and, and uh, with um, the um, IR2 area, um, there's been a lot of feedback about safety issues and uh, cycling and the, the inability to, uh, to put any um, kind of shoulder uh, in there. Um, but it, it's clear from this that there's also a governance issue that has to be resolved uh, to move something like that ahead. And I think it's going to be important um, how that gets articulated back to the public. Um, and and uh, so, um, yeah, just... Um, it's not necessarily 100% clear from the report, the, these sorts of inferences. So thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the active transportation community itself has gone through many iterations over the years. And so um, this um, plan has been many years in, in the making. And so um, it, it's, it's quite a feat to get to this point. And, uh, and I think it's great to put us in that position where we can take advantage of grants, whatever those may be, if it's, um, you know, an economic development lens uh, with the Island Coastal Economic Trust, or if it's uh, um, a, a school district and, and a safety, safe routes uh, lens, um, you know, uh, then we have, you know, those grant funding opportunities or whether that's through uh, uh, parks and recreation, um, it, it really puts us in a good position to uh, to take advantage of whatever avenue um, becomes available. And uh, and I want to thank staff and uh, our consultants and the committee members because um, it's taken a long time to get here and, and we're in a good position now. So thanks. So we're on receipt. Everyone in favor? Anyone opposed? 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, Director Hillian and McCollum. And the recommendation is to authorize staff to pursue the development of the implementation agreements. Any further discussion? <laughs> Again, it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thanks so much. So we're on to item five, Community Resilience Investment Grant Funding 2022. Grant and McCollum, thank you. And I'll pass it to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Doug DeMarzo, General Manager of Community Services, is here to present this report and answer any of your questions regarding the recommendation. Thank you. Through the Chair to the Directors, uh, this is about the Community Resiliency Investment Grant Program. Uh, is to apply for a partnership with the KFN in 2022. Um, this is mostly related to reduce the risk of wildfire, improve uh, the, the community's impacts and effects of wildfire, and empower communities to participate in wildfire risk reduction. Uh, the report seeks authorization to submit the joint CRI grant funding application uh, focused on fire smart education and activities for the public specialized training for local firefighters and uh, looking to continue our curbside woody debris removal and disposal uh, that we did with the chipper program starting last year. Uh, for clarity, the chipper program is only envisioned to be offered as a pilot and has always been subject to this grant funding uh, with the Fire Smart Initiatives. So going through this with a code box, uh, fire departments, so there'll be seven of them. We're looking to maximize the available grant funding of up to 200,000 with the KFN. And it'll be delivered through our emergency management planning division. I think uh, essentially we've been successful at getting this grant in a number of years in a row and had some good successful outcomes in the communities. So we hope that success will continue. I'll leave it at that. And uh, any questions is very important. Thank you, and we do, Director Hamir. Thanks, Chair. I'm super excited about um, you know more of this uh, chipping program. I, I've seen um, how successful it's been on on the other in the other communities that have had access to it. Um, but could you just describe? Like I I understood, or I, or at least I read that this was for Comox First Nation lands. But then I'm looking at all of the different. Um, fire departments that are involved. So, like geographically, where where abouts is this going to take place? It'll take a place in all the fire protection service districts that are done by our rural fire departments, as well as KF lands. Okay. So that's specific to um, the KF and approving this, which they have in the past, and then they and us together work on those lands through the KF and okay. land committees. Okay, music to the rural director's ears that never gets <laughs> in her community. So in, in full support, thanks. Thank you, I don't see any further questions. So we're on receipt and it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. And there's a recommendation. Grant and Hamir, thank you. Any further discussion on the recommendation? And it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried, thank you. Thank you, Doug. So we're on to bylaws and resolutions for first, second, and third reading. We have bylaw number 678, the Denman and Hornby High-Speed Internet Capital Contribution Agreement authorization. Grant and Arbor, thank you. And it's both the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried, thank you. And we've had a third moved by Director Grant and seconded by Arbor. Again, both the full boards, all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that is carried. So we're on to adoption, bylaw number 676, 
CBRD property tax exemption bylaw for Sunnydale Golf Society. Second. Grant and Cole Hamilton, thank you. Both full boards, all in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. And we're on to bylaw number 677, Comox Valley property tax exemption bylaw. Thank you, Director Hillian and Grant. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's adopted. Okay, so we move on to, oh, no new business. We move on to termination. Or no, sorry, in camera. Go ahead. Sorry. I just noticed a little late that uh, Item two lists Sunnydale Golf Society. It might be nice for item three in the title to also list uh, the Union Bay Historical Society. Yes, thank you. 